Good morning. My name is Aline Sir. Um, I'm the program director of the Masters Arts and Heritage. And I'm going to very quickly introduce the Masters to you. I will start by sharing my screen so you can see the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, so you should be able to see this now, even though I'm missing one element. Okay. Um, yeah, so welcome. Um, I'm happy to see so many of you uh, interested in this specific master. Um, so this is the Master Arts and Heritage. I'm going to present the English track. If you're interested in the Dutch track, there's a parallel presentation happening at the same time um, with you find the Zoom link uh, on the website. So if you want to switch sessions because you're interested in a Dutch track, uh, then you still have the chance to do this. Um, as I said, I'm Aline Zirp. I'm the interim program director. Um, I'm replacing at the moment Vivian van Saase, um, who will return in January. Um, so if you start the master next year, she will be the program director. Um, however, I'm going to present the masters to you. And I'd like to start with a picture um, to just get you yeah, into uh, the mood, if you so want. Um, uh, this is a very emblematic picture. I don't know if any of you has seen this. Um, this is from 2017, and it was just taken um, before or during the riots that happened in Charlottesville in Virginia uh, in the United States. Um, if you look carefully at the picture, you can clearly see that um, there's a, a statue uh, in the background. Um, this is a statue of General Lee, um, who was a Confederate fighter uh, during the Civil War. Um, just below it, uh, you can see a, a Confederate flag. Um, that's a symbol for right-wing movements, extreme right-wing movements in the US. Uh, and it's actually a flag that is forbidden um, below it, you see a little man standing there saying Confederate lives matter. Um, this is maybe a, Logan, a slogan that you remember from um, the recent movement in the US, uh, Black Lives Matter. So it was already there in 2017, but it was, yeah, uh, in, in uh, connection with the Confederates. Um, and you see in the, in the foreground, um, some people standing there in, in historic uniforms, if you so want. Now, why did I show you this picture? Um, it's, like I said, a bit emblematic of what the Masters is about. So this whole Masters is about the, the question of how um, we define heritage, um, how we define culture, um, what are the problems um, when, when we do that, um, who are the actors uh, in this process, um, what are the main institutions, um, what kind of policies do they, uh, do they, do they follow? or even create um, and uh, how can practitioners uh, deal with all these elements um, and uh, questions like what do we do for example with statues that are contested because this picture was taken because this was a contested moment right what do we do with heritage um, that maybe at some point of time was part um, of our culture um, but priorities have shifted uh, and uh, yeah, maybe the same statue that um, a century ago was seen as appropriate is not seen as appropriate anymore. Uh, this summer, we did not only have the Black Lives Matter movement, but we also had a lot of movements um, uh, tearing down statues. And there's a lot of pictures if you look at the media about that. So the masters is dealing with, with these kinds of questions um, uh, from a very practical point of view. So what, what are we trying to do um, with this masters? What will happen once you have finished it? Um, the aim is really that you turn into reflective practitioners and critical thinkers. That's also one of the reasons why I showed you the picture because um, if you look closely at it, you realize there's something wrong. There are some symbols on it that shouldn't be on there. Um, the main questions we're going to deal with, um, I've already mentioned a couple of them when I showed you the picture, but um, here's a bit of an overview is really what, what is the academic significance of art and heritage and culture? Um, what is the social significance of this? 
um, what do we do with certain works of art? How do we value them? Um, and why do we value some and not others? Um, who's making the selection here? And what are the selection criteria? Um, how do different ways of interpreting and presenting um, affect then our ideas about the past, about the present, and also about the future? Um, how are these processes interlinked? Um, generally speaking, during this master's, um, we do not understand art and heritage as objects or as sites. I think this is often, if you look at uh, definitions of both, um, you would say, or you would see uh, that, that heritage are heritage sites, for example, um, art is art objects, but we rather see them as cultural processes um, of meaning making and of memory making. And during the, the year, we are drilling very deeply into this process. So who's, who's making the meaning, if you so want? What kind of meaning is made here? Um, and how does that affect um, society? Here you have a bit of an overview of the different periods. Um, this might look a little bit confusing if you first see it, but it's, it shows quite clearly um, what kind of uh, courses you will have and how many uh, credits you get for them. Um, so we start off with uh, an introductory course, which really allows you to dive into the field. So entering the field, it's called, um, it introduces you to the main theories, to um, the main uh, practical workshops that uh, are being run. Um, but I should stress here, and that's not only the case for period one, but for the whole masters is that theory and practice go hand in hand. This is a very practically oriented masters. Uh, we make sure that you're in constant contact with practitioners, with people who work in the field. Um, um, basically, all of our colleagues uh, have one foot in the practitioner's world, so we are not just working at the university. Most of us also have a, a second job somewhere else. Um, and that is maybe one of the, the main important uh, elements of this master's. In the second period, so that is uh, the period just before Christmas, um, you get an introdu introductory course on how to research arts and culture. So this is a little bit more theoretical. Um, it gives you access to all the different tools that you need um, to be able to evaluate uh, arts and heritage and to be able to work with it. And then period three, which is a very short period and it's running after Christmas in January, um, you have two courses running parallel. You have um, a skills course, research writing skills that prepares you for the thesis. And um, then you have a choice. So you can choose between two different electives. Um, one is arts and audiences. Um, it's dealing basically with um, the whole question of how uh, visitor, visitors shape um, museum practices. Um, we're, we're looking at visitor research there, for example. Um, and uh, how that affects uh, how, how museums are dealing with, with certain issues. Then you have a culture and economy elective um, that is much more about um, the art market, for example, about auction houses, um, the, the economic side of things, if you so want. It's not a short MBA, <laughs> as uh, my coordinator was saying the other, other day, it's really focused on um, the arts and heritage world, but it is looking at financial aspects of it, um, at uh, selling points, etc. And the third elective is about heritage and society. Um, there we're dealing with, um, uh, yeah, the, the question of how the past is being perceived in society, um, how uh, heritage has, or heritage discourse has moved from a much more expert driven to something that is uh, happening on the ground. We're looking a lot into memory issues on how uh, commemoration works and um, how the past then obviously influences present and future. Um, in period four, uh, the choice continues. Um, so you have, uh, again, the choice between the three different electives. If you have chosen, let's say, arts and audiences in period three, um, then you will continue with arts and audiences number two. Um, and that's the same also for culture and economy and for heritage and society. The difference between uh, the two elective um, periods is that period four is, again, very practical. 
Um, we're going to work a lot on projects um, and you'll be quite independent in, in carrying them out. The projects uh, change every year, so it depends a little bit what kind of uh, society stakeholders um, we get on board. Uh, but to just give a couple of examples, um, for example, there's a, often it's, it's part of a bigger research project that's already running um, in a museum, for example. So you will join the museum staff um, and you will work on your own uh, yeah, little project for about six weeks um, with the museum staff on there. Um, we also had projects that were um, very uh, much oriented towards um, yeah, starting a business plan, uh, etc. So it really varies every year. What is important here is that you work very closely with society stakeholders. Um, so it's like a tiny little internship, um, but it's, uh, it's more on a project basis. Now, if you want to do a real internship, that's the other option. Um, you can choose uh, one elective in period three and then in period four, you start doing an internship um, in an organization. I will show you a couple of examples of internship organizations that are in our database, but of course you're free to choose your own internship organization. Um, for the internship, you get as many credits as you get for the elective. And then period five and six, which is the period just before the summer holidays, um, you have uh, only the thesis to do. I'm saying only in brackets, really, um, because thesis writing is uh, a lot of work. Um, so we decided to give you a whole period to do that and you don't have to focus on anything else. You can really dive into your research and uh, you can go and do research abroad if Corona permits. Um, and then uh, come back and submit the thesis during the summer. Um, there's a possibility of doing an extra internship um, uh, over the summer, uh, for example, um, if you haven't done an internship in period four. Uh, you can also decide to do an extracurricular internship after uh, the summer. Um, then we'd have to talk about uh, the whole question of if you have to get, be still enrolled at the university or not. Uh, the important thing is that that is always a possibility. Um, if you've followed all the courses and you have all the credits, um, then you can do this really on top of your normal workload. Um, I'm going to quickly run you through uh, the different courses. Um, I've already given a short overview here, but um, uh, here it's a little bit more in detail. Um, so like I said, model year one is, is really introducing you to key theories and debates, uh, professional workshops, etc. cetera. Um, and usually this year we couldn't do this because of Corona, but we hope that next year when you start, um, the situation will have changed. Um, but we always have quite a number of study trips. So in module um, in, in, in period one, uh, traditionally we've been going to Berlin and we spent a whole week in Berlin. Um, and meeting different practitioners in different museums. Uh, it's usually a very packed program. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun also for you because you've just started, um, you get to know each other as a group. Um, and uh, at the same time, you get to know uh, the, the culture and um, world of another country. Uh, in period two, uh, traditionally, there's a study trip to Amsterdam, uh, again, with the same idea, uh, lots of meetings with uh, professionals and museums and little uh, NGOs and different organizations, etc. Um, then again, the, th the, the three different modules are already introduced to you. And um, I put down on the slide also uh, the different elements. Um, it's very interdisciplinary, as you can see. Um, if I introduce you later to, to the different teachers, you will see that we all have slightly different backgrounds. So we're not all coming from the same discipline and uh, that reflects very much in the teaching as well. Module four, uh, again, continuation of the electives and then module five, the thesis. Um, for the internships, uh, this is just a selection. Uh, initially, there was like five uh, pages on, on, uh, on the PowerPoint when I uh, copied the list that we have. These are internships that have already taken place in the past, and these are organizations that we regularly work with. Um, as you can see, they're 
everywhere in the world. Um, we do not only have organizations in the Netherlands, uh, not only in Maastricht, but um, a lot of our students, they go, um, yeah, they go abroad, they go to different places um, in the Netherlands or in Europe or outside of Europe. And uh, it's always possible if you have an organization that you're very interested in to just ask if you can do the internship there. Um, and uh, as long as the, the organization agrees, uh, there's usually no, no issues. A few words about the core staff members and the areas of expertise. Um, as you can see, this master's is taught by eight different people plus guest lecturers. So we have quite a number of people um, who come from uh, outside and we invite them to give lectures on specific topics. Uh, I mentioned before that we often have practitioners coming in, especially for workshops. Um, but these are the eight staff members that are within the faculty. And if you look at um, their expertise, then you can see that, uh, yes, different, different areas, really different um, areas of discipline. It's also very international. Um, so we have, of course, uh, Dutch teachers, but then um, Germans, French. Um, it's, uh, it's very varied. Um, and uh, it reflects a little bit also the, the masters. Uh, I will show, say something about the composition later of like what our normal student body looks like. Um, this is probably not completely new to you. Uh, if you're interested in Maastricht University, uh, you might be interested particularly in uh, problem-based learning, which is uh, the way we teach in Maastricht. And it's uh, quite different from teaching in, in other universities. Um, problem-based learning is all centering around the idea that um, students get become agents of their own learning. Um, so you will hardly ever have the situation that someone is standing in front of you, a professor standing in front of you and just talking for two hours um, and you just sit there and take notes. Um, this is maybe the case in, in lectures, but lectures are always accompanied by tutorials and tutorials are very interactive. So they're very student-centered. Um, the idea really is that uh, there's a problem in the room and the problem has to be solved together. Um, very often you are the ones who are actually defining the problem um, together with the teacher um, and then you go off, do your research, um, come back uh, with potential solutions and then in the tutorial uh, we are discussing those solutions. Um, the idea behind this is that you learn much better um, if you are in charge, uh, if you can choose what is important, um, if you have the possibility of inquiring yourself um, and bringing in also your previous knowledge. Uh, and I think that is maybe the strength of this master's. Uh, most likely you will come also from different backgrounds. You will all bring in your own knowledge that you have from your bachelor, your upbringing, your cultural environment, etc. And all of this goes into the, the, the pot, if you so want, of knowledge uh, that we will draw from during the tutorials. Um, initially, problem-based learning uh, was uh, started in the medical school um, in 1976 when Maastricht University was founded, um, but since then it has been adapted. Um, those of you who know something about the bachelor programs uh, know that um, it's a fairly rigid seven-step approach. In the masters, um, we use something that is a bit more flexible. Um, so we're not following the traditional seven steps that you might have read about uh, on the website, um, but the whole idea behind it of self-directed learning um, is, is still there. This was last year's cohort. Um, I'm only showing you that as an entry point to tell you what are the other people that you can expect maybe if you choose this master's. I mentioned before that it's incredibly international. Um, we tend to have 20 different nationalities often, um, sometimes more. Uh, you would somehow expect that the biggest group is Dutch. Uh, that is not the case. The biggest group is also not German, even though uh, we are just next to uh, Germany with a, a huge population. Um, in the last years, we had a lot of uh, Italians. We had a lot of Belgians. Um, and uh, they're often followed closely by, yeah, students from all over the place, really. 
uh, this year we had, I think, 24 different nationalities. Um, so students from all over the place um, with very different backgrounds um, and therefore also different knowledge. And this is incredibly enriching for both the students and the teachers. Um, my experience is that uh, because you have these study trips, because you work so closely together, you will form a very closely knitted group. Um, and if I look at our alumni, uh, they are often still in very close contact with each other. They really become good friends over this year. Um, gender wise, you might see that there's a lot more women than men. That's also a typical element, but we've always had men as well. So this is not just a female masters. So just to uh, quickly summarize what I told you, um, this is a one year masters. This is important for you to know. Uh, just if you're interested in a one-year master's and don't want to do two years, it's very international and selective. Uh, we usually have about 200 applications or more, um, and out of that, about 50 are chosen. Um, it is taught in English and in Dutch. Uh, I mentioned before that there's two tracks, the English track and the Dutch track. Um, you're often together, um, but then for teaching, you're oft usually separated into the different tracks. Um, that's not the case for the electives, um, but for the other courses. And we use PBL as teaching method. It's very interdisciplinary. So if you look at the disciplines that uh, feed into the masters, we have history, we have sociology, uh, we have cultural economics, art management, museum studies, memory studies, and heritage studies. Um, within the masters, you're allowed to specialize uh, by choosing the different electives. Um, often students around Christmas um, know whether what they want to do with their thesis. Um, they have maybe an idea of the job area they want to look at, and then they choose the electives according to this. It's research based, but it's very much practice oriented. Um, we have the internship options. Um, and we have a lot of links with professionals and organizations, institutions that are working closely with us. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned before, staff and students is very interdisciplinary, very international, very varied. So it's a very rich uh, community of um, people. I should say a couple of words about the pre-masters program. Um, if you, for some reason, don't meet the requirements to enter the masters directly, uh, you can do a pre-masters program. Um, when we look at your applications, we sometimes recommend that you do the pre-masters first. Um, we usually have around seven or eight students doing the pre-masters every year. And if you do the pre-masters, you follow some selective courses of the Bachelor Arts and Culture or of uh, relevant minors programs. And those programs uh, and courses, they prepare you for the masters. Um, our experience is that pre-master students often enter the masters very well prepared because they already got used to the faculty. Um, they have some background knowledge. Um, they basically already have been working uh, in this environment for a year. So this is always a good choice, especially if you're not really sure if um, yeah, you have all the, the necessary skills and qualifications that you need to enter the masters. Um, this is a bit of an overview of the different courses that you will have. As you can see, they're all closely related to what you will do then the year after in the masters. I put up the link also for um, the website um, that you might want to check out for the pre-masters program. Now, some technical uh, uh, information um, about the admission. There's two deadlines. It depends if you come from the European Union or if you're outside of the European Union. Um, for non-EU nationals, the deadline is a bit earlier. So this is 1st of May. Um, for EU nationals, it's the 1st of June. Um, tuition depends a little bit on your situation. Um, so there is a tuition fees guide on the website where you can calculate how much uh, it costs. Um, but like the typical fees for EU nationals is around 2000 euros per year. So for the whole year. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd look at the, the fees guide if you wanted to know what, what is your specific situation. 
there are scholarships available um, and uh, there are some from the faculty but also from um, outside so i put up a couple of uh, websites uh, for you to check out um, if you're interested in applying for a scholarship um, if you apply uh, you first have to apply via study link uh, so that's that's a dutch uh, general um, application procedure um, and then after that uh, you get an automatic email with instructions on how to apply for Maastricht University. Um, there's also the website if you want to check out uh, the procedure directly. Now, once you've applied, um, you will be selected by a board of admission. So this is uh, some of the teachers in the masters and the program director. Um, and basically the, the criteria are academic merit, uh, English language skills, um, that's quite important. If you think that your English is not good enough, um, then I would advise you to maybe now uh, take another course um, because that is important to, to follow the master successfully. Um, and relevant experience and additional qualifications. So what we often have is students um, who do not directly come from their bachelor, um, but maybe have worked somewhere in a cultural institution before. Um, if you look at the age differences, uh, you have a, quite a big of a span. Um, not every, everyone is in their 20s. We also have quite a number of students um, that are a little bit older and have already um, a professional experience, which is, which is very nice because they bring in their own uh, experiences um, and, and just often have a different look out on uh, what, what you will learn. Um, this web, this this page is really for you also to look afterwards. Um, what may might be interesting for you um, when you study here. Uh, so there's a premium program, which is um, the honors program for um, all master students. Then uh, there's a research center that um, Maastricht has uh, created a few years ago uh, that you can closely work together with the organized workshops and conferences, et cetera, um, seminars. So that's uh, very interesting. Our current uh, program director is also the director of MACH. Um, so that's, that's a, a very nice link to have. And then there's Maastricht University Arts and Heritage Committee that you're welcome to join as well um, to see what they're doing. Here, a few more useful websites that maybe you want to check out if you're interested in this master's just to get an idea also of how it would be to come to Maastricht, um, uh, how housing looks like, for example, um, what other students are saying. So this is just a collection of links um, that you can uh, check out later. If you have any additional questions, then you can contact, um, well, you can contact me for now, but then uh, Vivian van Sase uh, later, this is her email address. Um, then we have two student ambassadors, uh, Lise Berten, who's um, for the Dutch track, and Alejandra um, Morilla Sosa, who is actually joining us uh, today. Um, so she's in the Zoom call and she will also answer your questions in the question and answer session later. Um, and I believe there's also uh, an additional session just with her where you can ask uh, all questions that are related to student experiences or the year, her experience of the masters. Um, if you want to see a few videos uh, to get a better idea, um, there's a video about the program, for example. Uh, there's a short video about one of the field trips. Um, this is the Berlin field trip. Um, and then one about the Amsterdam field trip and how it is to work with partners in the field. Then we have a couple of alumni interviews. So if you're wondering what people do afterwards, um, where do they end up? Uh, then we have one from Berlin and one from The Hague. Uh, students, former students sharing their experiences of yeah, how it is to, to find a job afterwards. Um, and that's really it. So now I will stop sharing the screen. And uh, you're welcome to turn on your cameras again um, and ask me questions.